So this is the Akai AX60 analog synth from 1986. And it's interesting because Akai has not made many synthesizers, especially not analog ones. They're famous for the, I guess, Timberwolf line or something being pretty terrible in the 2000s or so. But this is truly Akai's attempt at making the greatest analog synth they could at the time. And it's really interesting because right behind me, I've got a Korg Poly 6. And they're very similar in architecture, but kind of different in sound. So this is based off of Curtis CEM chips, and it's actually got the same chipset as a sequential um, six track or split eight, a bunch of the lower end sequential synths that came out in the later mid eighties. Um, and so that would be a difference from the Poly 6. The Poly 6 has an analog SSM filter. This is the Curtis uh, filter. And they both sound really good. I mean, Curtis filters are used, like, say, in the Oberheims, the SQ80, a bunch of other synths that I love. But there is a difference there. Um, let's check out a couple of sounds real quick. We're going to start with patch 1.1. One, one, but I want to give everybody a heads up that I don't love all of these patches, so don't judge a book by its cover. Um, it's more about making sounds with this one, I think. So let's check this out. Yes, it does have voltage controlled oscillators. Charles, welcome to the stream. Totally interesting, and I think it goes to show that this synth, unlike the Poly 6, which is a very simple synth, everything's great about the Poly 6, but this LFO is much more powerful because we have different shapes. So right now we're using a sawtooth wave, of course, on the Poly 6 you've only got the triangle wave, right? So that's giving it this interesting plucky sort of character. But then you'll also notice that something's going on that's causing it to have this fluttery character that's beyond just the LFO. So if I turn the depth off real quick, that's what's giving it that pluck, pluck, pluck sound. I don't know if that's the filter FM, which is a feature on this synth also that you couldn't do with the Poly 6. We'll have to discover that as we keep going. And you can hear that the resonance on the synthesizer is out of control. <laughs> like it is way extreme and um, to some people's displeasure. So uh, it's interesting to me how people relate with resonance in the vintage synth community. Because for instance, the Alpha Juno is one of my favorite synthesizers of all time, but it doesn't go fully resonant. So people are like, ah, it's not as good as a Juno, right? But the Yamaha CS80, the most famous of vintage synths doesn't have a fully resonant filter either and when i hear the harshness of this filter my dick hole clenches up like i'm not necessarily into that right you know so that's kind of one of those things where you know i actually kind of like a filter that's like maybe resonant but doesn't have to be dub what's up nick how's it going uh how is everybody doing tonight uh little bit of triangle wave action so again we've got a couple more features compared to the poly 6 i apologize to compare it 
that I'll be comparing it to the Poly 6 this stream. But the thing is, is that it really does have a similar feature set. I guess what it is that makes it that way is the fact that it is a voltage controlled oscillator synth, which usually means it's very expensive. In the case of a few vintage synths, um, for instance, I got my hands on a Jupiter 8, I'm sorry, Jupiter 6 this week, and I have a video up that's members only, which by the way, best way to help the channel is there should be a little way for you to join the channel as a member, which gives you access to all the cool emojis. If some of my scum family could blast the chat with emojis real quick to show off what I'm talking about, that would be cool. I guess in the playback video, you won't be able to see them because OBS doesn't pick them up, but we got a lot of fun emojis. And then also, um, I do members only videos. So the uh, Jupiter 6, I was able to actually play with it for the first time. And um, what was interesting about it is voltage controlled oscillator synth, obviously very famous synth, but um, really, you know, for the, th those go for about $6,000 and these can go for somewhere around $1,000. I got this one less than that. Um, you know, I really can't say that I think the Jupiter 6 feels any better than this. You know, this really has some amazing stuff to it, like an analog chorus and everything. Um, so, yes, uh, so Dub got a new synth, a DW6000, kind of some... One thing you'll notice is like sometimes it's like I have a dead key, but like if I change the patch, those keys aren't dead anymore. I don't know what that's about. This synth is a little wonky, so yeah, like see, I don't have this note, but if I go and then go back, I've got it. <laughs> Super weird. Thank you for all the spam. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, DW6000, incredible uh, hybrid synth. And you know, Nick, you're much better at actually like figuring out how to like open a synth up and check it out, try try to put it back together. Uh, how much did you end up paying for it? It was something crazy, I think. Something just totally insane. Um, Charles, I bought an AX60 for kind of cheap. Um, I didn't like what it sounded like at all, and it was ultra unreliable, so I sold it before it totally broke. It's based on Curtis 3372 chips. Yes, and I'm not sure if these are the same 33. I want to say these are like 79 chips, if I'm correct. Um, a lot of people say the, the, uh, AX60 sounds better than the 80. Now, uh, I'm hoping our friend, um, John over at Edgetone Studios, we're talking about collaborating soon and having his AX80 be featured, um, over the internet, piped into my studio and then out to this channel so that we can actually do kind of a comparison of the two cents. It would be really fun to do. Um, we shall see about that because I also love the components of the AX680 because they are in the Chroma Polaris. That's actually the exact same components, and that is one of the most legendary analog synths ever. See, it's a good example of, I, right now, To me, a sound like that is very beautiful. Now we could, of course, just crank the resonance up. And now I'm not straight up not having a good time, bro, right? So it's not always the case that resonance is good. We could try bringing this down. You see, you get these crazy and harmonious tones. Oh, there's, um, there's gotta be some filter FM or something on that that's giving it that. It's actually kind of cool around there. We'll, we'll get more into that later. 50 American dollars. What the fuck is up, Mighty Pinto? How are you doing? That sounds lame. <laughs> Let's keep moving here. We've got a high-pass filter, like on a JX3P, JX8P, JX10, Juno 660, 106. All of those have high-passes. bit of random LFO working its way in there. What's new, Pinto? How's it been? Uh, and by the way, guys, um, go ahead and subscribe to all the homies in the chat right now. I don't say it enough, but you guys are all amazing, and I just appreciate you. 
Uh, drink of water tonight. Waiting on my new control, or, <laughs> controller to arrive. Um, I saw something about that. Can you uh, give me the 411, the down low on what happened there? Mm. I'm drinking a nice Jade Terminus Absinthe tonight. So to me, this type of sound reminds me a lot of the Poly 6. I'm going to be comparing the two cents a lot. Because it has that sort of string machine type thing. We have an analog chorus on this synth. So here's the sound without it. Mode one. So it's kind of like a Juno and then it's got like two modes, just buttons one, two. Difference between one and two is pretty subtle. Maybe a little bit more speed to that, but it's not doing a whole lot in my opinion. Cheap thing broke midstream last night. Oh man, that's a thing. But anyways, bringing this down. That's sort of giving me that poly six string machine type thing. Which I think is uh, super neat. Love that type of sound. Uh, moving right along, I'm going to try to run through the uh, patches pretty quick here so you guys can just get acquainted with the sound of the synthesizer. A very, um, you know, Espencraft, Molshot Doma type sound. See, this is the stuff that, to me, elevates it beyond. You know, when it comes to these analog polysynths, one thing that kind of sucks is that once you've bought one, a lot of the times it's like, ooh, shit, these kind of all sound the same. And there's always going to be that argument about which synth sounds better than the other, does a Juno 6 sound better than a Juno 106? Things like that. And there's two angles. One is, yes, the components matter. Things like how the filter sounds, the oscillators, those do matter. How it all comes together matters. But then there's also the power of the synth. So the fact that we can do so much more interesting sounds... You know, the sort of like sound that's almost taking you outside of typical analog synthesis and we're sort of getting some sounds that are a little different, little FME because of the filter mod, also just more interesting. <laughs> with like the x80 for instance a lot of people say that one doesn't sound as good um but for me you know you've got the two dcos so that's the trade-off right this synth really does you get that voltage controlled oscillator thing there's certain vco synths like the poly 6 or the chroma polaris where when you hear the oscillators um you know they might as they're they're very good they're very in tune all the time this one, you can hear it kind of... There is an, um, there is a Tontac mod for this, which also fixes some of the issues that people say about it. Um, I'm not in a rush to mod this, and I believe the um, MIDI implementation is not great. But don't quote me on that. I'm just going off of what a, a Wikipedia said. Um, but I'm not in a rush to mod this just yet because I want to get to know it better. 
And one of the complaints about this synthesizer is let's say we wanted to modulate the filter by the LFO. So I could do that by simply increasing the depth. <laughs> to me, that's actually not that bad. Um, oh, that's the VCO, so I need to move that to VCF. Now check out how crazy the speed gets. We're almost in audio raid territory. And some people say that like the scaling is weird and you can hear how there's not that many potential values, right? Like we've barely moved the knob and we're already pretty. We're not even at halfway and we're approaching audio rate, right? If we were to set all of these at halfway, so this is like a good way on a really great synth, something I've noticed is when you set things to like 50%, it sounds fucking good. That's like where you wanna be, right? So let's see how it just sounds. You can hear, whoa, you can hear how we're kind of in musically not that great territory already. <laughs> like it, you would want it to be a little bit more musical at that point. With the LFO off, it sounds gorgeous and warm and super fat. I maybe can see how someone might say this is the superior synth of the X80. We'll have to see when we do that stream in the future. But, you know, that's a fat oscillator sound. That's thick with 13 Cs. place VCO shines versus digitally controlled oscillator is cross modding the filter with the VSO yeah with the VCO so that's a thing by the way guys if um you know I always try to split the difference when it comes to talking about synth stuff so half of the people who watch these videos know 10 times more than I do about synthesis and the other half are people who are learning about synthesis so when we're talking about well any synthesizer but it really matters with vintage synths Voltage controlled oscillators or VCOs are controlled by direct electrical current. And as such, just like everything, there's little like fluctuations and stuff. And so what happens is that imprecision adds a lusher sound, especially when you play more than one note at a time. I actually don't think VCOs matter as much with monophonic instruments as they do with polyphonic instruments, because when you play a chord. <laughs> That extra little bit matters. You get this interesting sort of warble that makes the, the chord so much more lush. Digitally controlled oscillators are still analog oscillators. They are not digital oscillators, but the tuning is controlled digitally, and so they are perfect. And in the 80s, they, there's a really big difference a lot of the time between VCO synths and DCO synths. Um, you know, we had a VCO synth on the stream last time where you couldn't play a low note and a high note and expect them to be in tune. Well, you couldn't on this one either because it's a fucking fucked up patch. Really cool patch actually in the middle here. Really bright, aggressive. We'll have to dig into how that was done. Super, super cool. But yes, um, you can cross mod the filter and that's something that's really awesome and powerful with this synth. So the Tontec upgrade is a bit involved. Gotta pull out the whole motherboard and attach a daughter board and yada yada. It's not a, chim a simple like Eprom swap. Ooh, nice little stringy type thing.
let's go ahead and keep moving here. I see some of these sounds are just really dreamy. That's a good example. You can really hear that beautiful oscillator drift here. You see, there's like an unpredictable nature to that tuning too, where it sort of, you know, evolves evocatively. Ooh, yeah, here we go. Uh, a little brassy. Oh, that is so gorgeous. Who needs an Oberha? Huh? sounds it's gorgeous and there's something about the way um kira welcome to the stream uh the way that the single so what's interesting here is you know because we only have one vco per voice but the chorus and the way you can modulate that really does a great job of making it feel like you have more compared to the sound of something like the Juno series, where I do really feel with that and even my good friend over here, the Poly 6, that, you know, you can definitely kind of sometimes be like, I could use a little more thickness. I wish there was something to detune against. I'm gonna take a split second here, turn on my Kawhi K3 over here. One of my favorite brass patches is on this bad boy. Patch number 13, I think. Uh, so let's check this out real quick. Oh, I don't have it on on the computer. All right, bear with me, guys. Whoa, science is happening. Believe, trust, trust me, okay? Why don't we turn the, okay, the D50's on. There's the K3. Appreciate you guys bearing with me, but I want you, I, I, I'm only doing this bullshit to make a point real quick. These patches are very similar, so have that in your head, and then let's see what it sounds like when I play it over here. Let's play it uh, down here. What is it? That thickness versus this thickness over here. I don't know. They're both really good. Uh, this one's a little darker maybe. So we could just bump up the depth level. I don't know. So the point is to say that that's two oscillators and this is one oscillator. And to me, the combination of that VCO drift with the chorus, let's put it on chorus two, see if we get thicker. <laughs> Hell yeah. That is, you know, making the erections happen in the crowd. Really fucking beautiful to play. Aquatic Borealis. How's it going, my friend? Welcome to the stream. Um, I think my dream of Kai Poly is the beautiful little VX600. Six voice, two VCOs per voice, 37 compact thing. Not just that, I've been trying to compile a list of all of the vintage synths with 
voltage controlled oscillators and aftertouch and it is incredible how few there are now not polyphonic aftertouch although that counts too i'm just talking about aftertouch at all and actually the akai vx600 is the only akai synth that has aftertouch roland only ever made one vco based uh poly synth with aftertouch and that was actually the rack mount jupiter uh, i forget what it is mps80 or whatever it's very rare and so that's a really cool synth uh definitely worth checking out what is up tiberian how are you doing my friend just gorgeous that patch is delicious and i think highlights how this synth you know really can be uh just phenomenally warm and analog sounding and then sometimes it can go way cold and interesting the sort of like a kind of like a variant on that sound i think this is i started with this patch to make the opening here of the video so let's see it's a lot of low end coming out of that filter you're gonna get crazy with this resonance why don't we fuck this up Sorry if I ripped anybody's head off there. I didn't mean to. Depth level all the way up. Decay all the way up. Off all the way. Whoa. <laughs> it's still going. Resonance. Uh, not even all the way up. But we'll bring it down and just see what happens. Oh, that was what I was trying to do. Release uh, does not need to be that crazy. Uh, VCF. Depth level. <laughs> crazy if i bring it down halfway you'll notice that affects the cutoff frequency as well <laughs> i mean again this is why people have modded this synth the values are pretty finicky <laughs> See, it, it affects that final point there um I'm going to crank the resonance all the way, but turn the master volume, like, way the fuck down. To, like, 50%, just so you can hear how fucking insane this is. Just, just bizarre how crazy that could be. From that sound. What is up? It's my boy, the Romex King. Going to the Philippines soon. How's it going, my friend, Chad? Oh, yes. Yes, the stepping is real, too, by the way. So if I turn that all the way off, and we get this. We've got that same thing that, like, the Chroma Polaris does. And, by the way... Jupiter 6 does this too. Also based off of CEM chips. Really intense sort of digital chipping, uh, chirping sense. Which, it's funny. On the Chroma Polaris, I absolutely love it. I don't know why. It's just like there's something about the way that synth sounds that it just works with it. And you only notice it, like, even when the resonance is shrill, it's like... It's there, but it, it's sort of an interesting sort of background texture. With this one, it's just way out of control. So what that is, is instead of it being as smooth of a filter, we're getting those discrete points. Now, if we put the envelope or the LFO depth all the way up and we have the speed kind of low, delay off, I'd be curious to know if we get that same stepping with the LFO. What is going on? I 
don't know, synth gods out there. I'm not really hearing that stepping the same way we were hearing it before. Um, I don't know. Let's see. That chorus really needs some detune to make it come out. I was not impressed by the first patch with the chorus on it, but that one sounds nice for sure. Yeah, it's some detune would be nice for sure. I haven't fully decided for myself if I prefer the sound, if I would prefer a synth with one VCO or a synth with two DCOs. I mean, in the case of like something like the Kawhi K3, I think it sounds great. It's hard to argue with it. And I love having control over that detuning. A synth like the DW8000 or the 6000, Nick, um, you know, the way the detuning is, it's so precise that digital, and it doesn't even matter that the oscillators are digital on the DW6000 through an analog filter, but it's just so precise. There's something about it where it does make me feel like I wish they were drifting a little bit. Whereas with this synth, you know, you miss the, the thickness, right? <laughs> Get a little bit of thickness with that pulse width modulation, right? I believe that's what we're hearing. Yeah, we have pulse width mod, just like on the Poly 6. Um, let's see, what else is going on? Bad Lux, welcome to the stream. How's it going? Yes, there's very little travel. Yeah, I got to play with one once, and yeah, that fil fader on the filter has such a small... Sweet spot. That's the thing about this synth. That's what everybody says is the sweet spots are, uh, you know, few and far between and they're hard to get. Um, honestly, so far, my opinion, just with my little time I've had with this synth, is I've enjoyed it and not found it to be so bad. I mean, I don't, for me, it's like one thing that's kind of nice about the low parameter resolution is I know if I just move it like that, I'm on to the next possible step you know what i mean by that like if there's only 10 options and you know here isn't good i just eh, give it a little one of those and i'm on to option six you know <laughs> so i don't know if that makes any sense but so far i've actually been enjoying very much so the one knob per function nature of the synthesizer which is good right i don't know I mean, if that doesn't sound thick to you, right? You know, like, fuck. Mike, welcome to the stream. That thing makes me want to drop four hits of acid and sit in a neon room with it. That's intense. Some of these patches have been pretty acid-inducing, though. Another nice brass patch. Nice squeaky resonance. Really, I mean, yeah. So I think when the envelope or the LFO is controlling the cutoff of the filter, it's pretty smooth. When you move the actual cutoff frequency, you get those weird sounds but i mean like this patch is just gorgeous Just glorious resonance, right? This is where we're getting into that filter FM stuff. Okay, whatever. The patch is fine. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, I'm the guy that broke... Oh. Got the broken $100 K3 and pulled a broken op and out of it. It came to life. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember you were saying that. Um, you've got a Poly 800 6, 8000 JX 8P K3 Motif 6. Yeah, that's great. I really want to get a Poly 800 sometime and do a shootout video with my Poly 6. So the Poly 800 was Korg's most budget 
analog synth from the 80s and it's also usually the cheapest synth vintage analog synth you can buy on reverb at any given moment and then the poly 6 is the you know most legendary one or whatever for whatever that's worth um but honestly the 8000s where it's at the six and eight how do you feel because dub station just got a poly i'm sorry a dw6000 how do you feel about that as an instrument does it have an analog chorus am i right in saying that the higher end dw8000 has a digital chorus but the 6000 has an analog chorus Got to kind of like, we could do some fucking 808 stuff. That's awesome. Like that key follow. Total fucking UK house vibes. That's awesome. Really cool patch. Kind of organy type thing. Ooh, daddy loves some amplitude modulation. I think that's what we're listening to. Oh, interesting. Wait. I do not understand. Is that the filter FM? Wow. I was expecting that to be amplitude modulation, but I guess it's filter FM. So what that is, is the, um, the oscillator is is being routed to the cutoff of the filter and that's what's giving it that sound yes analog chorus on the 6000 but it's not a juno no velocity even over midi well you know it's fun it's one of those funny things i don't think this has velocity A lot of these polysynths don't. I mean, the Korg Poly 6 doesn't. None of the Junos have velocity. None of the Jupiters have velocity. So, I mean, that's a thing. <laughs> you know, none of the Oberheim OB series has velocity, right? So, it's one of those weird things where it's like, a lot of the famous vintage polysynths, analog powerhouse synths, really weren't that expressive. They just sounded really good because of the uh, filters and the components and everything. This is where like using resonance can get you some cool stuff. I'm not like an organ guy. That's okay. Ooh, this one's actually kind of cool. That's like a dreamy piano type sound. Oh man, it gets terrible up here. That's terrible up there. as you can hear like you're really getting fm out of this really interesting how you get different different sorts of sounds out of that what is going on with this fucking filter doing that is it a key following resonance i think that's what it is i think it's just key following resonance that's giving it that yeah it's just hard to get that sound to be right it was it was cool though i mean i was it's it's intense how that extreme resonance interacts with things like VCO mod and the LFO. I can never really guess what's actually causing 
the sound I'm hearing, which is exciting. I love when a synth has some secrets for me because if you've been fucking around with synths for a while, you sort of get used to uh, VCO into, you know, detune two sawtooths into a filter, adjust the, cousin, the, the cutoff resonance, you know, and, you know, end up with something. That's a square. <laughs> Sometimes I just lose notes. Screaming resonance. That patch exists. Let's go to the decay. One thing I've noticed too is like this thing runs hot, like it gets dirty. is why I like this synth. That sound right there. Because it's got that like, there are those subtleties to that voltage controlled oscillator drifting in and out of tune that gives it that uh, just dreamy sort of sound. And it's so thick. It is just thick with 47 Cs. <laughs> That sound speaks for itself. I mean, I am blown away that these things are not worth more considering it's like a Korg Poly 6 in terms of its architecture, but it's so much more powerful. Um, and it's voltage controlled oscillators, which usually command a high market price. This is definitely for me like a super sleeper synth, like something that just does not get enough credit. I don't know, what do you guys think? I wanna hear what your experience with the synth has been so far because I have my opinions, but I'm an idiot. It's much more important to hear what you guys think about it. Does the filter stepping matter? Does the, the poor sweet spots matter? Or do, when you hear this, do you go, okay, I get it. Let's uh, add some release and to the amplifier. I don't know, man. That tickles. Hit auto tune. Yes, sir. Um, so I auto-tuned it before the stream. It might have he heated up a bit. So analog synths, especially vintage analog synths, tend to drift in and out of tune as they heat up. Uh, Charles loves organ sounds. Um, the other thing about the Korg Poly 800 is that it's paraphonic, uh, which is good or bad. Yeah, usually bad. Um, good for dub stabs. Yeah, I mean, I think with something like that, it's like, you can play, um, you can get a lot of sounds that you would need to get. Cause like when I play a chord like this, I don't need six individual filters moving around at the same time. I could just have one filter opening and closing. But if you play broken chords and like, you need those individual uh, filters so that it sounds right. Otherwise, it would be re-triggering every time. But, you know, for a lot of sounds, a lot of the times how I play, you don't really need it, you know. You do that type of thing. You don't need individual filters. Paraphonic's usually fine. Um, uh, give me a stab or two, please. Let's hear all that ARP. ARPs and big fat filter sweeps for the love of God. Sure. 
Uh, it's cool because of the value and character. It doesn't have to do a lot of things, but if but if it has those two, you're in business. Keep, yes. All right, so all we have to do is hit, I think, arpeggio on and off. And arpeggio hold, let's do that. So we can just pick something out and um, do something cool. I'm gonna turn that down. Got a couple of different modes here. That is crazy, it's doing both at the same time. Like, I don't think I actually moved the slider enough to change the value there. Is that like... Does that sound like it's doing like a little syncopated thing? I don't know. So you can get it to get a little steppy if you get a little aggressive with it. So uh, sounds like the Eurythmics, yeah. Yeah, we got splits. We got unison. We got a lot of stuff. I'm going to cover as much of it as I can tonight. So when I hear a sound like that, I'm like, what sound designer thought that was good? That's just a, like, I don't know enough about the science of filters, but to me, that sounds like maybe that's where this synth has gotten a little bit of a negative reputation because, you know, when you crank the resonance on the Oberheim, for instance, it's like glorious. With this, it's like shrapnel. filter mod going on I think I mean okay in terms of power like that's crazy like you're getting this sort of ring modulator sound out of it <laughs> It's very easy to rein that back in and get something beautiful. Right? I mean, so that's actually pretty impressive. You can get something that sounds that good and then with just a couple of things. I mean, 
mean, that's the power of a synth like this. And, you know, love it or hate it, because to to some people, they might hear that and go, oh, I don't want that. I want it to sound like a Juno. I want it to sound like a Jupiter. And have it just sort of be that basic sort of sound that, you know, vanilla analog polysynth type thing. But to me, when I hear that, I'm like, ooh, I, I'm bored of just silly brass patches. That, to me, I'm like... How the hell did that happen? And then you just bring this back down and then... You're back to very beautiful, thick, lush, analog polysynth territory. So, yeah, to me, I'm really excited about this synthesizer. It is uh, super neat. I want to do more streams on it because talk about something that I find inspiring uh, immediately with the caveats that, yeah, the sweet spots are a little bit harder to find on this synth, you know, it's not as simple. To me, you know, those types of patches are great. They're very usable. I mean, one thing is, is like, if you're looking at the analog poly market and you want to get that sound, right? You, you, this isn't speaking to some of the synth gurus out there in the chat right now, but maybe you're watching this stream as a, a newcomer coming from the world of VSTs and plugins like I did. And you're going, I want to get one synth from the 80s that's going to give me that sound, that's going to give me that thing, that magic, that, you know, voltage-controlled oscillator drift, the warmth, the thickness. These things go for so cheap a lot of the time. Like, this is a total sleeper in terms of, like, can it do that warm, analog, glowy thing? Yes, it can. This would be good if you use the arpeggiator. Stay on. Oh, yeah. Hey, Neil. very tight but not as tight as the moog source you know like that Yeah, so of course this thing can do um, splits too. So you can have uh, two layers layered over the top of each other. Ooh, that one's good. Let's go ahead and try that chord progression again. Hold, motherfucker. That's great. And you can hear that we're using the noise here, right? So we have a noise source. This sound is gorgeous. I'm actually shocked, Movug and shocked about how cool VCO mod and resonance together end up creating something. Because if you just listen to the resonance on its own. It's just so crazy that you're not going to have any fun. But if you get that VCO mod in there.
I mean, come on. That's awesome. That's totally different than any other synth that I have. I'm not sure. <laughs> I feel very silly. I feel like I've got to have a synth with VCO mod in here. Um, the Cro Chroma Polaris has a ring modulator built into it, so you can get those types of sounds with it. But, oh my god, this actually sounds like... Oh, I'm really in love with how, you know, stumbling upon this combination of resonance and VCO mod and just taking a sound to a completely different place than I ever think you know boring analog polys from the 80s sound like this really has its own thing for sure um they're a bargain but they've doubled in price since 2018 well that's for sure they were R rk 100 s2s i'm missing the reference and i feel stupid my friend That's fun. Let's keep moving here. Wow, really great usable, like, just analog keys sound. So we've got pulse width control here. Uh, I'm going to turn this off real quick. Oh, you can control pitch here too. If you want to do that sort of thing. But uh, we want to control pulse width. So if I turn speed all the way off. interesting uh i actually don't know wait oh i forgot too to mention a crazy feature about this synth is you can do pulse width modulation on any of the waveforms so this is sawtooth that's being pulse width modified I do not know if this is affecting the pulse width or the depth of the pulse width modulation. Hard to say based off of the labeling. So let's move and check out a couple more waveforms while we're here, right? I think this is a good patch to check it out. I'm gonna add a little bit more envelope depth to the filter. And increase the decay a bit. just so you can really hear what's going on. So. I can't tell. Yeah, it seems like the pulse width is affecting this. Yeah, so it's a pulse width depth, not pulse width control, I believe. Um, So pulse width for you guys out there, just getting used to synthesis, is sort of a way to cheat detune into a synthesizer. So when you have two waveforms from two separate oscillators beat against each other, or played at the same time, but they're not in perfect tune, they'll sort of cancel each other out uh, in a circular sinusoidal fashion, probably using too much jargon here. They get lush is what happens. And you can hear that if I just play this chord here with the pulse width modulation off, it's lush. But if I increase it, it's, it's real lush. 
it sort of sounds like you've got two oscillators. So the fact that you can do it on any of the waveforms actually is a huge plus and probably why this synth sounds so good for only having a single voltage controlled oscillator per voice. See, that sounds a little thin, but if I crank this up, we get in thick. Why don't we move on to, that's the range. Let's move on to the triangle wave. Wow. Yeah, so it is the depth and the triangle pulse width is interesting. cool then of course we can move on over to our square wave kind of typical pulse width sounds but it sounds really delicious then we have this great we've got triangle plus saw so if we want to get kind of in between those two sounds all right so check the thickness we're going to do a thickness check hashtag thickness check She thick. We're gonna move over, fuck, over to Sawtooth. Less thick. Back to Sawtooth plus Triangle. Thick. Thick up in that motherfucker. Really beautiful. Just, I am fucking impressed by this synth. I really am. It's, I'm more impressed than I thought I would be. By the way, guys, I don't know if this is obvious. It probably is because you watch me stumble through these videos and have not a fucking clue how to program these things, but I don't, I deliberately, I'll buy a synth and I will leave it. I'll turn it on and make sure that I can make a couple of sounds with it just so that we don't start a stream and then like the synth doesn't work and I have to go get it repaired. But other than that, I turn it off. Till we start this stream i'm like not trying to know about the synth before i go live uh and not because i'm trying to be like whatever but i want you guys to get my real opinion about this synth in real time like what is it like for me to experience the synth because hearing this i'm like god i say i got two things to say god damn this synth sounds good like it just does i'm really impressed are you kidding me that is so ridiculous the resonance is insanely gorgeous on this And that is why I buy analog synths from the 80s. You can get that sound pretty close with a VST, with a modern synthesizer. But I have to say, there is something in there. I mean, maybe it would be fun to do a shootout, right? And just compare, you know, what can be done. But for me, I mean, it's just like, wow. It's just... Let's see what's going oh, I'm just missing a lot of the chat. Sorry about that, guys. Um, what's interesting is, like, the way the envelope depth 
interacts with the filter. I don't love, to be honest. Oh, there is a VCA gate. That was what was causing that. Wow. I was noticing on the arpeggiator that when I was messing with the VCA, voltage controlled amplifier, envelope, I was still getting this like choppy sound, but that's from a gate. There's actually a gate. I totally didn't read the third thing because I'm stupid. Um, can it Hoover? Oh, the FA Music Department bought a bunch of Korg RK100S2 keytars. I'd love to know about that, actually. Death by Media, what's up, homie? actually didn't know a lot of the wax tracks bands used it like i've always wanted to get a Kawhi r50 so i could get that sort of drum sound from like early ministry and front 242 records <laughs> bjork might have used it i get it man yeah what's up death by media kidding me are you kidding me like i i don't love the fact that you have to wait for the release because like the release brings it all the way down i guess it's like the sustain level i need to mess with that now i'm like kind of see why the resonance matters <laughs> you know I mean, talk about versatility, right? Like, this is a totally crazy sounding synth. If you don't like the sound of that, your mother didn't raise you right. The original patch was kind of horseshit, but once you turn the release down... Wow, that sounds like an old vinyl record recording of some sort of weird instrument. Totally. God damn it. I wanted to hate this thing. I wanted to sell it. I give up, man. This synth is officially one of my favorite synths of all time. Like, it's just too interesting. And what's so funny is when I turned it on, I just went like bank one bank, you know, like I did this. I was like, I'm going to hate this synth. Why would that be bank one one, right? Oh, my God. Arpeggio on. Hold on. VCA gate. Let's hit that.
Okay. Someone smarter than me. Do you have a clean explanation for why the resonance is affecting the sound, like giving us this sort of crazy ring mod FM type sound? Um, I mean, I get it that the resonance is going to increase the overall impact of what the filter is doing. But for instance, if I turn this off and I just play... Um, oh, let's get a little bit more of a sound. You know, we have something, right? And then I increase the VCO mod. Basically makes it brighter. So we have kind of a basic triangle-y type thing. Triangle sounds delicious. Almost like a wave folding type thing. It sounds beautiful, but like still not that crazy. But okay, so minor chord. <laughs> it just like gets insane. actually sounds like a DX7, right? Doesn't it? it? It has that DX7 type sound. A little bit. I mean, it's a little warblier than a DX7. Um, can you take an S sampler in the back? Yes. Yeah, so uh, that was another major cool thing. So I intend to buy an Akai S sampler from the 80s. And um, I'm just, I, I don't love samplers. They're not my favorite thing. Um, I prefer, I honestly prefer romplers where it's just the sounds built in. You just go and whatever DSS one stream that we did this month. made me go, God damn it. Sounds good. Okay. Maybe I have to get into samplers, but, um, so this thing has on the back right here, it's got this 13 pin cable sampler in. So what you can do is you see a sampler button right here. You can press that. And instead of getting noise, you can actually use, um, the sampler as VCO2. You have to remember this came out the year before the roll in D50 with LA synthesis, aka sample plus synthesis, not being invented, but definitely being popularized. So, or becoming a thing that like everybody did. So the fact that you could run a sample through this polyphonically through the filter is kind of crazy. It's different than, say, when we ran um, the Kawhi K1 into the Roland SH2. Really cool idea, but you're not really getting polyphony. You're getting paraphony, right? Paraphonic play. Um, with this, you can actually use the sampler as a second oscillator. So you can use it as a, you know, that in that way. I mean, that to me seems so powerful. I wish that the filter was just like 10%, let's be honest, 20% more fine tuned. Cause then this would be like the greatest synth of all time, right? With the sampler involved. Sampler's like a thousand bucks. I'm sorry, guys. I am not made of money. I have to go out and work for buying these things. I do not make money off of YouTube. I mean, other than when you guys throw me tips, I make very little off of the ad revenue. Um, not enough to afford these synthesizers like I probably make in a year what the synthesizer costs to give you a rough idea of what I make. I think that's against the rules for me to actually say exactly what I make. It's awesome that I'm monetized. That's an extra AX60 a year I get to buy off of YouTube YouTube revenue, which is amazing. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not trying to sound like uh, an ingrateful child. Like, it's so cool that this channel is doing as well as it is. But I just want you guys to know I'm not like bringing in dough like the reason there's so many cents around me in this room is because i'm fucking psycho not because i'm getting these for cheap or like the youtube ad revenue is paying for it you know what i mean i don't know i don't i feel gross about this conversation but i hope you guys understand where i'm going coming from it's going to take me a while to be able to save up enough money to uh, actually be able to do this so and i actually took another day off work a week so that i can try to do more youtube content doing the Roland D50 programming video as part of that. 
Oh, yeah. Legend of Zelda shit. Now, I'm curious if that's got um, VCO mod, because it sounds brighter, right? I didn't realize that's the Song of Storms. I was saying that, and I just accidentally hit the notes. Maybe not. Maybe it's just how the triangle sounds. Yeah. Run the ARP rate at ridiculous speed one time. The resonance is very unusual. Yeah. Oh, wait, a 303, welcome to the stream. What do you not like about it? I found it to be an upgrade from the 60 in every way but the unison mode. Um... So I guess you're asking about the X80. So in terms of history, the X80 actually came out first and then they came out with this afterwards. So the designer of the X80, I want to say was from Multivox. It's a very famous Japanese designer of synths. And so the X80 actually has a really cool thing. I also love the look of it. I love gold on synths, but the X80 has a really cool look too. So it's hard to say one way or the other um, what's going on with that. Um, but it's a, you know, the, this synth, I don't understand. I don't think there's any real history about who designed it, but they added the one knob per function thing that people were missing, but you have the amount of oscillators, but you got VCO. So it's this weird sort of back and forth. You got the sampler in option that you didn't have on the X80. So it's always like an argument between the two synths. Uh, for some reason, these go for more. I don't know. Got it out and mod it as an input if you wanted. That'd be interesting too. I was trying to figure out if it would be possible. I think some people have tried to figure out if you could run something else in um, basically sending, you know, MIDI on off messages and audio at the same time into this. So like, for instance, if you could figure out a way to convert audio and MIDI into that 13 pin sampler cable and then have an iPod here with Omnisphere 2 with a six voice mode running into this motherfucker, that would get my Johnson hard. <laughs> What's up, Orlando? How's it going, brother? Um, let's see. The displays. Yeah, the displays on the X80 sound really cool. I haven't even fucked with the Unison yet, so we'll try to find a patch that'll work on. So to show real quick how quickly we can edit on this, we've got these three buttons for the different options here. Just go to the VCA. lot of release what I'm just trying to do is get a sort of good sound going so we can turn unison on and then really fuck it up you know so let's drop the octave down to 16 wait so we get real nasty with it resonance all the way up unison for the upper and the lower Doesn't it sound like the LFO is doing something? What could be causing that, like, pulsing? I have no fucking clue. PWM, that's probably it. Also, we had noise.
boys going there. Less than less than half is already like maximum on the Chroma Polaris. Getting really crazy sounds there. Turn unison off. Yeah, so we're getting that sort of a thing. Um, thank you very much for being smarter than me. Um, Death by Media with the PWM mentioning. Tuning from home this time. Well, cheers to not being at work, motherfucker. Good to see you, my friend. How's it going, Orlando? Mm. Let's see. Um, what else is going on? PWM? So every time you press a button on the PCB's flex, and so do these solder bridges between the PCBs. Ooh, they will fail, but it's not hard to fix, but hard to reinforce. Makes it less reliable long-term. The CM3394 was quite the versatile SOC. Good to hear everything's good, Orlando. Yeah, I'm, I'm into it, man. There's a lot about the synth to like. I'm, I'm very fascinated by it and find it to be honestly like... A little bit, it sounds very much like the Chroma Polaris in the sense that the Polaris has the ring mod, so it can take you in that direction too, both based off of Curtis chips. Um, Polaris was 84, this is 86, so, you know, think about that. Um, but I find this easier to interact with in a certain way because it's all just right here. It's all laid out really good. Everything feels very nice about it. I'm really impressed by this synth. Um, there are the things about it that you wish weren't that way, like the stepping of the filter. I would love it if it was like the Poly 6, where there's like no stepping, right? And that the resonance didn't seem to get so insane so quickly. So this is like that, so interesting, kind of like a piano sound, but if we add the mod, if the resonance isn't crazy, the, the VCO mod sort of acts like a brightness that's wonderful. Like helps it cut through the mix because this synth is so fucking fat, right? Without it, it's almost like it sounds beautiful on its own. But, you know, I can think when you get into a mix, it's like there's no room for the bass line. By bringing this in... sounds really good but then once you in increase the resonance it just gets like so bizarre so quickly let's try something like this I'm going to do it. It also helps the lower cutoff frequencies be more interesting.
I don't know. I just think you can get some really interesting stuff out of this for sure. How you like to make drugs in my outlaw days. Have a great night, Autumn. Thank you so much for hanging out as always. I love you very much. The dragon. So I think this is the LFO on the VCF. I can see this is falling down a bit, but it's fine now. Sounds beautiful. PWM sounds so good. Just immediately inspiring. I'm really impressed by the synth. It's so funny. It's like for every, there's almost like a pattern with the patches where it's like great sounding analog patch, great sounding analog patch, that shit fucking crazy resonance patch. Then something with the VCO mod and the LFO and the resonance happens that's like gorgeous and like, wow, like ring mod meets something else, like just totally insane. And then, like, basic-ass vanilla analog pad. <laughs> like this. <laughs> the PWM on things like Sawtooth and Triangle is just... You can hear the voice stealing. Really beautiful also. So those are your two basic patches. I'm like psychic when I said like it's two basic analog patches, something gorgeous uh, with the LFO and, and uh, VCO mod and whatever. Guarantee you the next patch is going to be atrocious. Ah, I was wrong, damn it. Oh, I, maybe not. Maybe I wasn't wrong. Actually a cool patch. Oh, are they the same synth chip? That makes a lot of synth actually. <laughs> makes a lot of synth actually. Makes a lot of sense actually. So, um, I have a Matrix 6, six right over, the sixth right over there. Um, love it. But if I had to have, if I had to sell one of the two, the AX60 or the Matrix 6, it's going to be the Matrix 6 all day long. Technically, you can do more with it. The Matrix, Mod Matrix is powerful. 
But I don't know if you can do more because the VCO mod and some stuff, you know, you've got two oscillators, digitally controlled oscillators over there versus voltage controlled over here. But this to me is more inspiring. I'm hearing sounds that are more exciting, more interesting, more versatile, more different. The Matrix is gorgeous because it's got that Oberheim thing, but it doesn't entirely, right? Like there is that thing about the Matrix where, you know, you really aren't going to get a great rush res type sound. And like that is a thing I'm looking for out of a synthesizer. Still haven't quite conquered it. Um, this really great, totally underrated synth, totally underrated in my opinion. All right, that's that. I love that you can get these sort of uh, trance gate type sounds out of it too. Here's the annoying one. I mean, it's cool. Big Space Invaders vibes, right? The resonance is, is impressive and does sound gorgeous. It can get way too crazy, but it does sound good. Uh, so, I don't know if this is organy, but I think of this as like analog electric piano type sounds. Let's add some depth to the VCO here. A little too much. Now we're getting that sort of, I'll add a little delay so we get that. It starts in tune, but then goes out. giving you that like lo-fi chill studying vibes that's what i mean about this synth giving me like instant analog nostalgia like better than some of the older analog synths like it gives you that feeling of like Dreamy. Like, this synth sounds dreamy. That's the only way to describe it. And then, you, you know, it sounds great and beautiful and captivating. Then you add VCO mod and resonance in it. Falls the fuck apart. <laughs> oh my god, it's so crazy. Very shallow differences here.
Aquatic, I uh, promise you if I sell my Matrix 6, you can have first dibs on it. It is an impeccable condition from a massive rush van. I bought it off a guy in Miami and he had the wood panels replaced or the original like plastic sides replaced with oak wood panels. It is in gorgeous condition. Um, it really is a special synth to me for the story and everything, what it means to me. I have to say the Matrix 6 is like, it's weird because like, for instance, a Matrix 12 to me is like sort of a dream synth. Like, I don't think I'll ever be able to afford one, but it's, um, when you hear like, um, I think it's called Vintage Synth Solutions, really cool new YouTube channel that just came out. Uh, they did some stuff with like the Yamaha CS70M versus the 80, and then they did the Matrix 12 versus the Matrix 6. And, you know, on paper, notch filters, all the cool stuff that you love about Oberheim, you can do with the Matrix 12. It makes it kind of incredible. But when you actually hear it, just like the patch comparisons, it's like the 6 and the 12 sound pretty damn similar. And then, but on the other hand, when I listen to the Matrix 6 versus some of the other ones in here, I'm like, yeah, it's kind of got that thing, but something about the DCOs and everything, it doesn't quite give me what I want. So it's weird. I have, like, conflict about that synth, I guess. You can hear that in my voice, right? What is going on? Okay. This is using a negative envelope for the filter, I believe, which is giving us the ability to have it rise at the end, which is pretty cool. Here's this, here it is. There's this really interesting. Yeah, it's just immediately like interesting, beautiful, different. I have been sleeping on VCO mod, clearly. That is such a cool thing for a synth to have. And I haven't been paying attention to it. Like if a synth has it or doesn't, I haven't really considered it too much. Now I'm like, I want every synth to have VCO mod on the VCF. It's just too cool. sounds like a bit crusher now I mean I know that's the noise is controlling it but all right last patch
Let's try that again. Just insane how much power there is actually hidden inside of the synth. When I wrote Analog Powerhouse as the descriptor of this, I was thinking just based off of the features that like it was basically a poly six that could do a little bit more, you know, like kind of expand a little bit beyond that. Um, now I've totally changed my mind. I think that this synth is uh, just just out of control. Just one of my favorite analog synths of all time, for sure. Like just the way that you get unpredictable results. And, you know, I think that the reason the resonance is so crazy is because of the VCO mod. Like, I'm beginning to feel like that's more intentional from the designers because it doesn't get interesting until the resonance is beyond insane. Then you start getting really crazy VCO mod stuff. But when the resonance isn't crazy and you've just got like... Turn on, motherfucker. Yeah, hold. Come on. Like, it's not really doing a lot. Like you sort of need it to get into that, like where it's overdriving for it to really start to feel like it's doing something. I mean, like, just throw a little reverb on that and your cyberpunk ambience is done. Seb. One chord. Synth is playing itself. I didn't know profits could do that, but that sounds amazing, dub. Now I'm now I'm convinced, you know, that there's something there. I never noticed it really until this synth. I could I could listen to it all day. 
I could listen to that sound all day. It's crazy. It's it's delicious. It's gorgeous. I love the synth. We didn't even talk about like sample in how powerful that that that's going to be on this thing. If you could run a sampler into this, put whatever sound you want in it. Are you kidding me? I mean, yeah. Okay, final thoughts. Um, you know, get one if you can. Considering the cost of a sequential Take 5 new, something like 1500 bucks, you can get these all day long for less than 1500. Now, Take 5 is going to have a lot that this doesn't. It's going to have effects. It's going to have a lot of things. Five voices, voltage controlled oscillators versus six. Trivial. Um, no stepping in the filter. Other things like that. But when I hear this, I'm like, wow, this is special. This isn't every other synth, you know? And i uh, be interested to hear. I'm going to do some research on the Tontech mod, but... I don't like it when synths have too many like page two functions. And I'm almost starting to feel like the designers of this synth actually wanted it to be extreme with some of the settings because you know, all of this stuff is fine, but the resonance VCO mod's crazy, of course. LFO, I mean, like. <laughs> If we move that to the VCF. It's not that crazy. I think it sounds good. And then, of course, it gets crazy. But that's almost interesting too, right? I don't know. This VCO pulse width on the sawtooth or the triangle or the sawtooth and the triangle, fire. Out of control. Sexual tension released. <laughs> just, just like, I don't want any more analog polys that don't have pulse width on the VCO. Do I wish it had a second voltage controlled oscillator? Sure. But maybe it wouldn't be so special. That's what we buy vintage synths for, in my opinion, is to have something special as opposed to something generic. There's a lot of really great modern synths out there, no doubt, right? And a dream of mine would be to make my own synth. So I get it, you know, I, we need to have new products to drive the industry, that's great. But when I have something like this, the sort of like hidden gem that's been passed over, I mean, it took me so long to find out about this synth. And then even till, you know, two hours ago, I was very skeptical. I bought it because I thought it'd be interesting to have on the channel. I've never played around with an Akai synth. You know, I try to have like one of each brand so you can kind of get a different flavor from everybody. But I was like, there's probably a reason Akai went out of this synth business. This is, uh, it's just, it's, it's incredible. It's really special. I, I hate how long it took for me to find this synth. I mean, this synth gives me something that is so important to me personally, which is that it does not feel like a VST. I know that sounds stupid, but like it feels so far away from that. It feels like, wow, it's so thick and analog and juicy, but then you've got this interesting stuff that I wouldn't have come upon. Um, just, just in love with it. I think it's great. So those are my thoughts. It has an identity. I agree. Death by media. That's the perfect way to say it. Um, uh, then what was needed, but also limited to about 40% of its range. <laughs> I wonder if there's a mod to go to 100. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's like, it's bizarre, but it's way too much. But maybe that's what makes this interesting. I think if 
you're watching this video and you're like, I'm going to buy one analog polysynth. I can, from the 80s or 70s, I could understand why this might not be it because certain things about it are a little frustrating. But not really. I, I'm not, I have not been frustrated this stream. I've, I've dealt with a lot of frustrating synths and samplers in this room, and I had fun the whole time. Very fast editing. Really no problems. Parameter range, sure. Kind of crazy. Not, there's plenty of throw on these. I'm fine with the throw. Um, it all feels really smooth. It's crazy that the synth is, you know, coming up on 40 years old and it feels this premium um, without being repaired or anything. Uh, feels as good as my Poly 6, which has a brand new key bed and completely rebuilt and oiled and cleaned and everything, whereas this just exists from the 80s with that level. Um, I'm sure there could be issues with some of them. Like I said, mine's a little wonky. Occasionally get a missed note, so that's a thing to think about. Um, but, you know, overall, uh, yeah, just, just 10 out of 10, Akai. Wish you'd reissue this because it's really special. It is a problem, like, same thing with the resonance. You're not even at 50% and it's crazy. You're not even at 50% and the, on the depth here and it's, or the speed and it's just like. It's like too far. And then not even 50% of the resonance and it's too far. I mean, it definitely does have that, like, Oberheim Matrix 6 filter growl. And then we could, but you have to be careful. In here, I, I move the, the fader and nothing happened. Then you move it a little bit more and it jumps to the next parameter value and it's crazy. Yeah, just, just great. Um... The VX900, I don't know about that one. I know about the 600. The interface is great. That's what's the why this one sells probably for more than the, uh, the X80. All right, so we just dial that back and then... Come on. Come on. Yeah, see, it's like it just jumps between those three parameters. That is delicious. I think um, that's uh, where I'll leave it. It just sounds great. I really love this synth. I can't believe that this is a sub thousand um, dollar, you know, vintage synthesizer. I believe Guitar Center has one for twelve hundred bucks right now. You could go get one shipped to your door, um, and if you don't like it, 
Guitar Center has a three-day return policy. Just bring it right back to Guitar Center. Really impressive. Really great. All right, I'm Vulture Culture. Look forward to that D50 programming video. It should be coming up this Sunday, if not this Sunday, the next Sunday. Really excited for it. It's going to be a three hour powerhouse training program for anybody to make sounds with the Roland D50. Um, I made the sounds in this background music you're hearing right now. Um, with this D50 behind me and the PG-1000. If you do not have a vintage D50, the Roland Cloud version has the PG-1000 built in and it sounds really good. So that's a great thing if you're into trying to get that vintage sound. You can make cool stuff like what you're hearing right now um, with a vintage synth like that. I think the D50 has just such a special sound, special place in my heart. I know it's not analog, but to me it typifies what I love out of vintage synths, definitely one of my favorites. It sounds so warm and fat. And uh, yeah, just really appreciate you guys for being amazing and hanging out with me every week. Um, depending on what happens, if I get the video up this Sunday, then we might do a stream this Wednesday on D50 sound design, which would be really cool. I've been putting in a lot of hours to try to get that happening. The new D50 video has over 4,350 edits in it in three hours. Just want you to think about that for a second. How many edits that is, the amount of time that went into making this video. And, you know, there is this thing where it's like, I'm not 100% sure it's going to do that well because, like, not that many people in the world have D50s. I'm hoping the Roland Cloud users will find it useful, but they might not because it's, like, on the hardware and they might not think it works on the software the same way, even though it does. So we'll see how well it does as far as the video goes. But uh, if you guys would check it out and put it on in the background, that would help me out a lot. It's the best way you can help the channel actually is just to watch more videos. So there should be in the description of this video, there should be a link that says like, watch all my synthesizer videos or something like that. Click that link and throw it on whenever you're hanging around, throw it on in the background. It helps the channel even more than subscribing and liking the video. That's great. If you haven't done that yet, please do it. But the biggest thing you can do to help the channel is actually just to watch more Vulture Culture videos. With that, I am Vulture. You are the culture. Love and light, bitches. I am out.